our factory cable has a long path due to its lay, and it has a number of fusible links. Two 12 gauge for the alternator, and one 20 gauge for the alternator sensing circuit, and two 12 gauge for the glow plugs. It's an essential cable because not only is it the main path to the batteries, it multitasks for all those pathways. Therefore, a complicated cable assembly if you tried to replace all of it. And it's incorporated into the main engine harness. But we need to understand how the cable performs. The Society of Automotive Engineers has specifications for everything used and designed in the automotive manufacturing world. For high current circuits like starters or this level of an alternator, the maximum voltage drop is in the range of 10 to 20 hundredths of a volt, or 1 to 2 tenths, depending how you want to call it out. Time to start walking into the four foot weeds. This is one of the layouts I have in my electrical spreadsheet to check an existing cable. All this can be done on just a sheet of paper. It doesn't have to be this elaborate. This example is good for alternator cables as the current flow changes. As sophisticated as it looks, it's not rocket science, it's just high school electrics. In the left block, I have a table of wired cable resistance values per 1,000 feet, which is how suppliers spec their product. The resistance values are from Anchor Marine Cable. I prefer marine products as they tend to prevent corrosion. In the top area, I can enter the length of the cable, the resistance of the existing wire or cable, and the voltage I'm working with. In this case, the 6 gauge cable is 42.5 inches long, and using a standard of 14.4 volts. The second block then uses the manufacturer's 1000 foot resistance value, and calculates it to inches. That's just the manufacturer's spec, divided by 12,000, multiplied by the length entered above. Voltage drop is calculated by multiplying resistance by amps. I can change those amp values to whatever the range I'm working on. The voltage drop is subtracted from the voltage entered up top, and a calculated percentage loss is made. You could leave it like that, but I'm a graph guy. The graphs are just presentations of all that information and I highlight the SAE voltage drop limitation of 20 hundredths of a volt, indicated by the red line. The stock wiring can carry the alternator. The fusible links may not. We are starting to push the limit. We're at the maximum current output. The voltage will seriously drop due to the resistance of the wire or cable. And depending on how long it can be at the high current flow, the cable will heat up. Although one could speculate this is precisely what the LN230 amp needs, a reduction in voltage when the output is high, to get along with the glow plug control module. But that goes against the goals I think we would all want out of a charging system circuit. Once the glow plugs are off, we want the fullest voltage we can get at high loads. If we look at the typical operating current use of pickups, 16 amps of engine controls to 75 amps of all electrics on, it performs in spec, a voltage drop of one-tenth of a volt. Reality check from the engineers. Being enthusiasts that we are, we're going to want to examine what happens outside of the average. The 140 amp alternator generated this at idle. Adding a small pulley generated this. And at elevated RPM, this. That's snowplow territory. So even with a stock alternator, there's room for improvement, if you want to. The other thing this graph tells us, when we see a lower voltage with high electrical demand, it's not always that the alternator can't keep up. Resistance in the wires and connections have an impact. But of course, this video is about adding a 230 amp alternator to the truck. At idle, at maximum. So this cable should be addressed for any alternator over 140 amps, ideally a complicated assembly. 
so it's best to supplement it with a layover parallel cable instead of trying to replace it. Two parallel cables will share the current, a current dividing circuit. Now everyone has a choice, a visual statement cable or a form follows function cable. If you want to install the positive cable like this, you have to increase the cable size. Anyone trained in electricity or electronics knows the best designs have a short path to lessen voltage drop. Long cables have high resistance, but if you want to do it this way, you need a big cable, which carries a cost. Or you can follow a shorter path, shorter than what was done with the factory design. I'm a form follows function guy, the short path, but that's a call you have to make. Just to confirm, the factory cable with all its fusible links stays in place. Presto Lite has a TSB for a large size of cable for this alternator, but it all reads 12 to 16 foot or less. The environment for most of their products has the batteries way far down on the frame rail, and I believe this is part of the thought process. So I also have this set up in my spreadsheet. By using the length of cable, the current flow, and a voltage value, the spreadsheet calculates the voltage drop for all sizes of wires or cables in the table. And I also have it set up to display graphs. But this is a setup used if you're targeting a max amps and determining what size cable you should use. Using the factory cable of 42.5 inches, we can see how it calculates out the different sizes based on 140 amps of flow. I'd like to use the lower part of the graph and try to select a cable that is below the knee of the curve, the flatter area. So while a 6 gauge cable meets the SAE maximum of 0 0.20 volts, a cable around 2 gauge or larger might be a better suited cable for my goals, as a single cable only. At 75 amps of all devices on, the curve and knee are still there. At 230 amps, we have some work to do, but at the stock cable length, Something from 1 gauge to 4 aught would work, but we're not replacing the 42 inch cable. We're going long. I measure this lay to be about 72 inches total. So I'll plug 72 inches in as the length. Most do it yourselfers and some vendors use a 1 aught cable for this, and it's a good choice for this alternator size, even if it was the only cable. The length of the cable increases the curve at high current flow, an increase of resistance with every inch. Looking at the maximum output of the LN230, we would have a 14 hundredths voltage drop if this was the only cable. Reducing the current flow to 75 amps of all stock electrical devices on minimizes the effect of resistance. I could use this spreadsheet and enter every amp value but it's not the best presentation for a variable current flow situation of an alternator. I'll go back to the earlier spreadsheet. I've changed the amps in the column. So as the only cable, this one watt cable would meet SAE specs up to a 320 amp alternator. And if someone wanted to go crazy, there's room for crazy with two watt to four watt cables. The form follows function choice is a stealth mode and it's 18 inches long in my case. Plugging in 18 inches and 220 amps into my cable choice spreadsheet gets this. I'm using a 4 gauge cable, which would yield about an 8 hundredths drop. Lots of cables for improvement, even a 2 gauge would get you into the flat. If I lay over the two examples, the shorter cable distance is less compromised, flatter. And in the other spreadsheet, also has more room to grow for larger alternators. Compare this to the visual cable lay. Time to start walking into tall corn. First we have to deal with the series resistance if we want to do this properly. We have two parallel fusible links that form a series circuit once they're paired with the rest of the cable. 
As I showed in the video with negative and bonding cables, parallel wire or cables act like larger cables due to the lowering of resistance. So the resistance of these two usable links combined is half. In the note at the bottom, the fusible link resistance is in series with the rest of the cable. So they are summed together. Now we have the actual resistance of the factory alternator cable, not just 18 inches of 6 gauge cable. As before, the voltage drop is just resistance multiplied by amps. And now that we know the cable's true resistance, we calculate the actual values. Most of the time it meets SIE values, but now at 140 amps, we are just outside the limits for the rare times we would generate that much current. Adding the visual 1 watt cable of 72 inches in parallel changes things. 8 hundredths of a volt drop. That's way better as a parallel cable than what we saw as a single cable. 14 hundredths. Parallel cables share the load. And the 4 gauge short cable does better by a minuscule 2 hundredths. A 2 gauge does as well, but it's not significant. Length of cable means more than diameter. I'm moving to the forest. The story is fusing protects the cable. I see it more than that. It also protects everything in the circuit. The simplest way to use a fuse is rated to the current flow, but that's not how SAE requires it. And based on the standards of SAE, fusing can handle a little overload. I have no intention of hacking up the factory cable fusible links. And remember, they are in parallel they should easily be able to handle 200 amps. And they do on the glow plug side. They will be oversized in this parallel cable configuration. Now we're getting into current dividing, and there's a calculation for that. We need to know the maximum amps and the resistance of the cables to figure out how the current flows for each cable, and then determine the size of the fusing. Once you know the flow of one cable, you subtract that from the total amps to get the other. The fusible links will be oversized. You could cut one of them, but I won't. I want to be able to put a stock alternator back on the truck. But any cable, visual or form follows function, calculates to a 250 amp fuse. In my past life of having $60,000 worth of test instrumentation in a test vehicle, under this situation, we would have gone tighter to a 200 amp fuse. And considering how short of a time they would be at the higher than 75 amps for a stock truck, the time delay aspect would allow for even lower. And when I don't think about it, that's a habit I often fall back to, despite not being the standard for SAE. There are slight variations not only from the different manufacturers of cable, but also between AWG and SAE cables or wires. But it's a small difference, certainly not enough to go crazy with the variations for this video. Marine wire is AWG sized, tinned, and is more expensive. I have used it for decades in automotive applications, and because it uses finer strands, it's more flexible. Its insulation is self-extinguishing, but not the highest temperature rating. I prefer it as it's tin to prevent corrosion. You have to make your own determination of what you want to use. Marine cable will be more expensive. Everything marine is. There are two online vendors I've gone to for marine cable. Genuine Deals is one. Greg's Marine is the other. Fusing can be done in several ways. This setup is convenient and easy. It is at risk if there is battery terminal leakage, but it's also something I've used and often recommended. This is an interesting setup, fused off the battery and protected with a loom. All of these cables need to be protected with a loom. 
It uses a standard holder, but others are similar. Amazon and other sources have different holders and the fuses. And if you're good at crimping, then soldering, two 10 gauge fusible links work too. In this video, I showed two different designs. One costs less and is utilitarian. Both met operating principles. Both are reliable. You have to decide which way to go. But the intent of the video was not about spreadsheets. It was to show with high school math you can determine the wire or cable you need for your project, not just use an online table. And sometimes what instinctively looks like it would be better may just be the same. It turns out size does matter by length. Thanks for watching.